for the strains of the Doctor Who music fading away in the atmosphere. It's a very good morning to Tom Baker. Good to see you with us, Tom. Oh, good morning, good morning. And how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm very well. I feel so well, I feel slightly guilty. Bad as that? Well, it's as good as that. <laughs> you have just put out uh, a Doctor Who recording. Uh, let's have a little bit about the recording. What's it all about? Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's just a sound version of uh, of a typical Doctor Who adventure. That's all, and it's been put out uh, simply because I suppose there isn't enough uh, visual Doctor Who going on. The audience uh, enthusiasm is so great the whole time, and one considers its response in terms of uh, the two Doctor Who exhibitions, notably in Blackpool. Mm. Someone came up with the idea of a record, and uh, the response so far has been very warm. Of course, Doctor Who is the sort of show that you could happily run 52 weeks a year, no problem. I think so, yes. I mean, in America, where they run the back tapes of former Doctor Who's, in some stations, they run them every night, you know, to, uh, not networked, of course, but in the regions, to mm. great enthusiasm, yes. I think you could run Doctor Who every night. When, uh, when you're actually doing the show, and the show's going out, what sort of a male response would you get? Pretty tremendous, I would think. Oh yes, oh yes, much more than I could. Co much more than I could even totally open myself. Yes, mm. I mean, I have help with it. Two or three people help me with it all the time. Is Doctor Who? Uh, Doctor Who has this massive response because I suppose, in a way, it's you know it's the best fantasy program on the television. I mean, it really is. No uh, doubt about there's it. nothing. There's nothing quite so heroic and nothing quite such fun as Doctor Who. And I want to talk to you as we go through the next hour about Tom Baker and how Tom Baker views Doctor Who. Uh, first of all, then, let's go back to the record. I believe the proceeds of this are going to a pretty good cause. Yes, yes, they are. Uh, the, the royalties on this record are going to the spastics, yes. That's uh, nice. Uh, I'm, very now, I'm very interested in sort of spinning off some of my good luck <laughs> That's towards, nice. towards some people who don't have my luck. I mean, I think it's not often you're in a part where you can really uh, exploit that on a big scale, you know. It's really very nice to be able to do a recording, enjoy doing the recording. The recording benefits the programs. The audience like it a lot, as I'm sure they will. And in addition to that, some handicapped people who are very deserving also benefit. And what's the name of the story? It's called Doctor Who and the Pescatons. And, and who are the Pescatons? Well, the Pescatons are sort of uh, Jaws-like creatures who've uh, come from a planet called Pesca and are short of water. I mean, in that sense, you know, there's nothing original about their dilemma. It's, it's again, a, a notion of a takeover of Earth by outer space monsters. They're rather splendid monsters. They're sort of ten-foot-tall combinations between sharks and men. And they talk in rather guttural... American-type accents, I'd say. And here we are with Tom Baker, Doctor Who, on this Thursday. Good to be with you, and good to have Tom with us in the studio talking about the new Doctor Who record. We're going to get back to that in a minute, but first of all, how did you get yourself involved with Doctor Who, Tom? Um, well, I think that uh, most of the decent jobs have come one's way, really, you know, are striking lucky. There was apparently a rather distinguished shortlist, which I never inquired about, uh, when the part became vacant. And I'd just done a children's film called The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, a special effects film. Huh. And um, the BBC had fortunately seen this film. And I was, uh, I was working on a building site in London as a, a builder's labourer, which is not an uncommon thing to do. And it was quite a jolly job. I enjoyed it a lot. And I happened to apply to the BBC just for a job in a general way. And a man I applied to, on the night he got my letter, I mean, he read the letter in bed, his last letter he picked up from the office, had actually come from a casting session of Doctor Who and had had no ideas whatsoever at all what to do. And he said to his wife, what about Tom Baker? And she said, that sounds an interesting idea. And the next day he rang me up and asked me about it and said how, you know, would I take some time to, to decide, to think about it. And I thought about it for about seven seconds and, you know, was very happy to hand in my hod and, um, joined the BBC again. No. I mean, it's the most sought-after job in some ways. I mean, some people might deny it, especially the people who didn't get it. 
But it is actually a very sought-after job. It must be, it must be, because it, it puts you up as a national figure and a national, a national loved figure. And yes, that's right, a national, yes, a figure, a figure. And you walk into a ready-made part, it's there for you, it's that's now right. up to you to do something with it. That's right, and, um, and, and it's such fun to do, you see. I mean, if one's doing moody plays of the month or play for today, uh, you know, that might be very hard work establishing working relationships uh, each time, and it's all very anxious and fraught and realistic. Well, as Doctor Who operates, you know, right off the ground, to, for starters, you know, the man comes from somewhere else, has mm. two hearts, can bend time and space, isn't interested in sex, um, doesn't have a house or isn't interested in a big, big money job, doesn't fire off guns or kick people gratuitously. It's a curious thing is that those restrictions on the character, one would think, would take the tension out of it. In fact, it works entirely the other way. The children seem very preoccupied with someone who doesn't do those things. How do you get on with children yourself? Are you... Uh, well, ter I get on terribly well uh, with children. I, I mean, enormously well, but it's because the children, of course, are not responding to Tom Baker. They're responding entirely to the fictional character. Okay, Doctor, I mind yeah, Doctor Who gets on well with kids. How does Tom Baker like kids? Oh, yes, I, get, oh, I like children a lot. Uh, you know, I, I do very much like children. I respond very much to, uh, in a, uh, as Tom Baker, when I go round meeting children, which I do an, an enormous lot. Um, although I'm appearing as a character, I'm, I'm clocking very much the observations and responses of children towards the programme. I mean, I take very seriously what they like about the programme, and often I take their notes and carry their notes through. Uh, we have big arguments about, you know, whether children will like this or not, and often I carry the day with a big hammer because I'm the one who goes out to meet the children. I'm the one who gets the letters. Mm. I'm the one they respond to. What sort of reaction do you get from children of various ages when they come up and they see Doctor Who from the telly in front of them? And are they overawed or are they quite happy to chat? Hello, Doctor Who, how are you? Well, up to about five, they're, they're mostly t instantly intimate. Uh, and ask, a boy asked me on Saturday in Paynton, he, he asked me quite sweetly, he said, would you like to come out and play with me, Doctor? I like being called Doctor by the little ones, you know, because the whole thing is just so sweet and funny. Mm -hmm. A little boy in Oxford said to me uh, a few weeks ago, that he, I said, how old are you? He said, four, four and a half, he said. I said, is that nice, being four and a half? He said, it's lovely. And I said, how long have you been four and a half? He said, oh, two or three years now. <laughs> um, it is a sort of in instant intimacy, because the children, nat quite naturally, they know me in a domestic context. Huh? Uh, I, I know the pr programme frightens them, but I believe they like that. They feel they know me. I mean, I'm probably the only man in London wearing a Burberry and exercising a rather reesty-looking dog in the park <laughs> to whom don't talk to strange men doesn't apply to, you see. I mean, I'm, I'm just lurching through the park. And, you know, it's hello, doctor. And I'm into a conversation with small children. I often see their mothers looking rather anxious about it because they don't recognize me. And the children are terribly embarrassed by their mother's ignorance, you know, and say, go away, Mum, it's Doctor Who. Tom Baker with us this morning on BRMB Radio, talking about Doctor Who. All right, the kids love it, and the kids very quickly tell you what they like and don't like about it. Is the adults' conception of the program uh, as spot on as the kids, or do they try and assume what children like and get it wrong? Well, I think the young adults are very sharp because they've grown up with it. Um, I think the university audience is a very interesting. The Doctor Who Appreciation Society is a charming title. Uh, at places like St. John's College, Oxford, and at the, at the University of Sussex and places like that, where it's a very in thing to watch because, of course, the present generation of uh, undergraduates uh, were watching William Hartnell in 1963 when they were very tiny indeed. And it's something, I suppose it's a sort of reminder of home in a way. Hmm. Uh, and it's something also that one really wouldn't imagine that university students would like. Uh, uh, apparently there was, a, there was a rather gleeful report back to the office where some uh, rather reactionary university official was delighted to say that a very, very small sit-in had been broken up by a replay of a Doctor Who tape. <laughs> <laughs> So um, but the, the older adults, of course, I think their, their preoccupation with the programme is entirely governed by their observation of how the children react to it. I notice that sometimes when the children come to see me wherever I am, it might, say, take two hours for a child to get through the queue to me. And I notice that his parents, I mean, I can't imagine queuing two hours to see anybody, but they will queue two hours for the child to see me. And when the child gets near me, in other words, when it's his turn and I say, hi, how are you? 
Uh, I noticed that the, the parents break left and right, and after two hours waiting, are uh, simply not watching me, but watching the child's reaction to me. Yeah. And that makes it perfectly understandable why they queue so long. You see, I, I think anything that has a good influence on the kids is bound to have a, a nice reaction. Uh, oh, well, how do, you, how do you respond to Mad Mary and the rest of the gang that think that Doctor Who is an absolute menace to children and should be taken out and burnt publicly? Yes. Mm, well, it just makes me titter, really, because, I mean... I hope know, she's I've not listening. Her. If she heard you say titter, we'd probably be off the air. Sorry. I've, just, I've asked her out to lunch uh, once or twice to try and put her right on this. I mean, she just simply doesn't understand. Uh, it's really rather like... What, you have tried to reason with her? Yes, I have, because she's attacked the programme several times. And, of course, I can't answer in an official way, because, since, you know, I work for a corporation, but... Um, I've made it known that I'm perfectly willing to talk to her about it, and I feel that if she met uh, the people who make the programme, including me, because I'm only one piece of it, um, she'd understand, you know, that we're terribly aware of how far we can go. I mean, it is true that Doctor Who is a frightening uh, experience for children, but what Mrs. Whitehouse... Mrs. Whitehouse often confuses us with movie horror or, you know, the horror of the newspapers or something. What she doesn't seem to grasp is, you see, that while Doctor Who is very frightening, it's very frightening in an entirely domestic context. So the children actually, who like to be frightened, I think, enjoy both pieces of the cake. They actually enjoy looking in one direction, being frightened by the Doctor Who music and the monsters. And the hairier and more slippery they are, the more the children like them. Yeah. And the moment the child takes his eyes away from what's scaring him, even if he's crouched over the back of the sofa, he can see his fish fingers and the fridge yeah. and his dad coming up the pathway or whatever that is, you know. So there's a, it's actually enjoying the experience, I think, of being put into suspense in the security of being at home. Um, I know all about the children who watch you through cracks in doors and from yeah. behind chairs and things and under cushions. Yeah, I, re I believe everything I read in the papers as well. Too. <laughs> um, well, when it comes to this sort of criticism, I must be quite honest with you, when you're saying that... Uh, uh, you're something about the horror, the horror of the newspapers. I think in, in, in some people's case, it's the horror of not having your name in the newspaper. And, you know, there hasn't been enough tits and bums on television this particular week. Uh, so, you know, l let's have a bash at Doctor Who and I'll probably make the Sundays if I'm lucky. I really often feel that this is the motivation. I'm very suspect of this sort of motivation. You may not be as cynical as I am. Well, no, I'm not as cynical as that. But, I mean, I am a bit suspicious. I think that people... Um you know, people's reaction to uh, television programmes, they often seem to me to be, and it makes me a bit anxious, are often unable to actually separate the fiction from the fact. I mean, for example, I'm a, um, I'm a great pub man. I, uh, I love a pint of beer or gin or something, and I enjoy pub company. Now, since I've been playing Doctor Who, it's really not possible for me to go into pubs after, say, half past eight or nine o'clock at night, simply because it just gets very boring, because after people have had five pints of bass, you know, or nine rum and peps or something. Or Ansels. Yes, or whatever Ansels, whatever it is, or <laughs> Tetleys, or Green or Whitleys. You know, I can run through the bitters. Uh, they get very curiously, they simply can't separate me from, from the past. Now, I didn't mind it actually early in the evening when uh, quite sober and I can hold my own, but when they're a bit loaded, it gets very heavy, the same old gags all the time, you know, or they... What are you... What are you... What's top of the Doctor Who top ten boring responses? <laughs> what, what do you get? Well, curiously enough, you see, there are only three or four things that people ever say, and each one thinks he's said it for the first time. <laughs> it's, you know, have you got your Daleks outside? Oh, it's very, very difficult. Good. It's very difficult for me to fall around laughing 38 times in one evening at that kind of observation. Yeah. Um, I didn't mind that. But, I mean, what I mostly enjoy, actually, in the street... You see, the thing is that Doctor, when you play a character like Doctor Who, your whole life is transformed in a very benefit, in a very gentle way. I mean, you know, if you go on a bus, you you work in in radio, so you're not recognisable um, in the streets. Now, if I go on a bus, I'm also one of the few people who gets on a bus where that becomes a little event, where the bus conductor is very bored of being a bus conductor, and quite understandably so, comes along and says yes, and I say uh, tenpenny to Notting Hill Gate or something. And he says, I haven't got... Here, yeah, aren't you Doctor Who? <laughs> and I say, well, yes, so, sort of. <laughs> and he says, listen, he said, my boy... He said, listen, could you just sign these tickets for me? <laughs> or, I mean, changing checks in banks or, or cashing checks in restaurants or if I buy myself some new pants somewhere. There's no problem anymore because the people 
allow me, they ascribe to me all the qualities of the character. I can't imagine Doctor Who actually with his trousers off. No, that doesn't, that doesn't work. They'd have to, they'd have to lock you away securely. Doctor Who without his trousers just isn't right. It doesn't seem right, no, 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 no but no. he does take them off from time to time. No, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't accept that. <coughs> Tell me, what, what drew you to your building site and to Doctor Who? Uh, uh, one looks at some of the things you've done, Nicholas and Alexander, and some of the serious work you've done. Um, what draws you to this incredible role? Well, I mean, the, the first reason is just um, is just a job, first off. I mean, I was on the billing side, not out of choice, simply because I was out of work, and I like to keep active. I mean, you're I a big fellow. I don't know whether listeners realise, even seeing you on television, you're a very big, sturdy fellow. Yes, I am a big man, yes. Six three or something, yeah. Fifteen stone. But, yes. But how do you take to that sort of work? Oh, I mean, oh very easily, very easily. Terrifying. I mean, uh, they, were, you know, they were very nice to me anyway. The thing is, I'm in very reasonable condition, you know, I can shovel and wheel barrows around and climb scaffolding and all that. I mean, I enjoyed it a lot. I think that uh, anybody can profit by any kind of experience, he said glibly, as if that was a wise observation. But actors mm. particularly are able. I mean, I've often worked with people I hated or cultivated people I've hated in the hope that one day I'd be able to play them in something. Really? Well, yes. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, you... I mean, we were watching a man at the... T I was at a test match recently and I was watching a man in the front row who seemed curious enough to be, I suppose, just a real pig, the way he was treating this woman he was talking to, and he was drinking like a lunatic, and when he laughed, he went purple, had a funny way of rolling his eyes and touching his nose, very bad-tempered way. And, uh, of course, anybody can do that. A writer can clock it away, but an actor can, you see, just put that away there, and sometime or other, you can soak it up. So, in other words, there's a sort of marvellous parasitical process that goes on, even if when you're in a even when you're in a rough situation like scrubbing floors or working on a building site or working behind a bar, you can actually soak off from people more than someone who wasn't able to use that experience, you know, except to complain about it. You're so not. I, mean, a I, I had no problem yeah. at all. You're not afraid of hard physical work then? Oh no, no, by no means. I mean, I don't think with my sort of background, uh, sort of people I come from who are very ordinary. I mean, I don't consider even long days acting. And I mean, sometimes I'm working for. 15 or 16 hours, I mean, I don't consider that work in the sense of the places I've worked in. All right, you've led to it. Let's follow it up. Where do you come from? What is your background? Well, I mean, I come from, I just come from an ordinary, wo routine working class background in Liverpool, and I come largely from a labouring family where people had to work, like millions of others, extremely hard. And usually they were working. Uh, the emphasis on me saying, well, I don't find acting all that strenuous is simply because, I mean, compared to most people I know who have to work physically very hard, are not working the things they want to be doing. So when you do find something you absolutely enjoy doing, then, you know, it ceases to be that awful grind of either being on a production line where I was in Meccano years ago in Liverpool or in a, in a biscuit factory or in a bread factory I worked in or on a building site. That wasn't agreeable to me because I didn't want to stay there. But what, it's what easy for you? me to get up in the morning. It's very easy for me to get up in the morning and go to work and start playing around with Doctor Who. I mean, when I see people... I'm on the train going to work to play at being Doctor Who and trying to make these scripts inventive and amusing for children and full of suspense. And other chaps are going to these terribly insecure jobs like their solicitors or their judges or... What or do you mean insecure? Under... They're not so insecure. Oh, I think you'd have to be insecure to be an undertaker, wouldn't you? I don't know. Uh, anyway, I don't think that they enjoy life so much as I do, but I mean, I'm only judging by appearances. I'm not very familiar with undertakers. I have a sort of... Uh, <laughs> sneaking mistrust of them, which is, of course, quite wait, irrational. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Patience. <laughs> but, um, I mean, all I notice is that whenever I go anywhere socially, and I, I, actually, someone took me to a very grand club in London, and a sort of fellow who gets very embarrassed when I'm recognised in the street, which I constantly am, he said, we'll go to Brooks's club, and it'll be very discreet there. So we're sitting in a bar in Brooks's club, and uh, suddenly a very uh, elegant rather middle-aged man came in and he bought a big brandy at the bar and he turned around to survey all us rather solemn people sitting around drinking and he looked right down the line and when he when he his when his look came on me his eyes lit up and he, he was lit up as well and he said my dear doctor and my friend who's rather grand in london and keeps club society a bit was horrified at me being recognized by a judge one of her majesty's judges <laughs> in brooks's club 
very nice. It's very nice, you see. <laughs> but, and, and the thing is, uh, my whole life is, is spent like that. So uh, while other people are actually sorting out Lloyd's Register, or the Prime Minister is telling us that something won't happen on a Monday, and then it happens just after lunch on a Monday, you know, I'm moving professionally in a world where all I've got to do is actually find diverting and heroic activities which will entertain and amuse and occasionally instruct the children. How does one get from the sort of upbringing you had then, which is, uh, as you said, a hard working upbringing, to the rather fanciful world of the actor? How did you get across that? Because I'd have thought that in the, in the atmosphere you were brought up in, uh, the acting profession may not be regarded as the most manly of professions. No, no, it wouldn't have been. I mean, there'd be, there would have been lots of people in my district who would have thought I was a fairy instantly if I'd wanted to become an actor or a ballet dancer or an ice case or something, but uh, it happened uh, as it did to lots of people in my generation who were caught by national service, you see, because that was a, del a delicious time to be in, because one was forced to do something one didn't want to do. And so one had two years license, boiling resentment and bloody-mindedness. <laughs> and, of course, one was driven into, into oneself to, enter, you know, to divert oneself. And, uh, of course, I got into, you know, unit shows. And lots of people who were caught by national service got started in that way. And when I discovered, actually, that I could amuse crowds of people a bit, and when I discovered I couldn't tap dance and didn't know any foreign languages and couldn't sing and I was too nervous to steal, it came to me like a thunderclap. And the thing to do was obviously to become a star. And so I set about, and uh, I've been biting and kicking and screaming my way to the bottom ever since. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's get back to the record. Doctor Who and the Watsers? The what Pescatons. The Pescatons. It, it, sounds, it sounds almost like something that they, they, they'd give you on a bad day, <laughs> and, and, and that you wouldn't be asked to swallow. Yes, like um, a drug, yes. Does it? <laughs> Tom Baker, before we say goodbye to you, I want to thank you so much for coming. What now for Tom Baker? Um... I'm going off to see some people in Manchester tonight and uh, stay there sometime tomorrow and then race mean, back to London. Didn't mean tonight. I meant, oh, tonight. Like, I meant that, was a wide, oh, that was a wide, deep and probing oh, question. I see. Oh, well, the answer to that is very simple. I'm, I'm caught up with filming Doctor Who until next uh, February and then I hope to we go into production on a Doctor Who feature film, which will be a very grand hundred-minute affair. It's time we did have a Doctor Who feature. So I'm spoken for happily until, I suppose, next August, which makes me feel extraordinarily secure. And you, you have no plans at all of, of, of leaving your role. You're very happy with Doctor Who. Well, there's no need for me to leave it, you see, because by arrangement with the BBC, I'm able very, very easily to take time off to either write something or to read something or to go to the pictures or even just to... Uh, or to do another job by arrangement, you see. So I mean, I'm hoping, actually, this... Uh, before Christmas, to be able to manage a two or three week play on the, on the fringe, you know, just doing it and rehearsing it in my own time with two or three other fellows and doing a play. So really, even if I wasn't on contract to do Doctor Who, I couldn't lead a more freelance life. Or I could, but I mean, I wouldn't have the same good jobs. So uh, you're pretty content so with I'm your lot, really. I'm very content as it goes. I mean, I know when to finish a Doctor Who because I think the audience will signal that. And as long as I feel it's growing, not at all a static part. As long as I feel it's growing, I'll stay with it. I often find it difficult to understand why people have a part that is very successful, or why a singing group is successful. Let's look at the Seekers, or the old New yeah. Seekers, as they were, whatever. And so many people like this, or, or um, Pertwee, or Hartnell, or whoever had this part before. Um, who was it? Shatner, wasn't it? It was Hartnell, Troughton, and Pertwee. Troughton, yeah. Yeah. Now, why... Why people have something successful and then they decide to throw it away when it must be bringing them not only good money and, and, and a lot of respect and a lot of work. I, I don't understand the psychology of throwing things away when they're successful. Maybe you can explain it. Well, I mean, I think sometimes it's just self-delusion that people think that the world is their oyster and go on and do much bigger things. But I do th I'd like to feel, in my case, or the case of some people I've known who've given up big uh, jobs uh, in television or films, I'd like to feel that they, the way they decide on that is because they lose the dynamic. I think that you can't stay still, can you, really? It's, you've got to keep feeling that you can push on and give something to it. And the moment it becomes repetitious, then you're forced just then to make an economic decision about you say, well, I'll stay with it for the money. And then finally, what the single factor of money, if that's pinning an actor down, then, you know, you're, you might be in big trouble. When you took Doctor Who on, 
yeah. Tom, did you consciously decide, I'm now going to give a new dimension to Doctor Who, because you've obviously given him a new dimension? Well, they say that. It's very nice of you to say that. People do say that uh, it has changed, rather. No, I wasn't. All I was conscious of, to be honest, was my terrible nerves about whether I could, in fact, deliver it at all, because the man before me had stamped on it extremely hard. Curiously enough, apparently everybody's felt like this. Uh, they were all successful, and uh, it's gone on and on and on to bigger figures, and now we're breaking hi history with the figures. I, uh, how many people would see Well, I mean, sometimes, sometimes we get 14 millions. Incredible. It is incredible. I mean, I was in Amsterdam a few weeks ago, which is the only, uh, Holland is the only country that takes Doctor Who, and it was a very nice feeling getting on the plane, getting off the plane in Amsterdam, and discovering I was very famous there. You mean the only foreign country? Uh? In the only foreign country in Europe yeah. that takes it. Uh, I suppose Belgium catches it uh, by accident, but Holland is the only country I think that buys it. Mm. They're very frightened. I think in Italy and Spain they wouldn't show Doctor Who. They're yes, but Holland also have a policy of showing lots of stuff in English. They do, yes, they do, yeah. They show a lot in English with subtitles, whereas, say, if, if Germany was going to buy it, they would have to dub it. They never do a subtitle thing there. They would dub it into German which is more expensive than showing it in English with the yes. subtitles. That's, I yes. think it's economics as well. My goodness, I don't know how it sounds in German. <laughs> uh, I didn't know about that at all. But um, it's, I didn't know why one... I can't really intellectualise about one. One stays with... I stay with a job because it makes me happy, really. I mean, the only sort of job I would dread, really, would be a massive long run in a single play. Uh, fortunately, that's never really happened to me on any scale because any long run I was in at the National Theatre was offset by the fact that I was in repertoire. So although one may have done 180 performances at the Merchant of Venice, one would also be in the Idiot or the National Health or whatever other play was running, you see. And that's my idea of bliss. I mean, I, I always saw myself as staying in one theatre company. But that was again, you know, the self-delusion. Because there suddenly came a time when I was offered films and I thought, well, I must try films. And off I went and thought I'd become a movie star. I don't know where I got that idea from. I must have been reading old magazines or something. <laughs> I remember my mother always saw me as a new Michael Wilding. She thought that they were still making films called Spring in Park Lane. She didn't realize that Anne and Eagle actually wouldn't act opposite to me. Uh, but I left there and went on to, the, to do the movies and came back to the, to the theater, freelancing in the theater, and then out of work onto the building site and then onto Doctor Who. Of course now. If I'm free, I, if I were free or if I wanted to make time, I could uh, do an awful lot more work, which I choose not to do. Now, if, uh, if you at home could speak to Tom right now, I'm sure that so many of, uh, of you would like to say what I'm going to say now, which is thank you so much for all the pleasure and the joy that you give us through your work. Thank you for joining us on BRMB. I wish you lots and lots of luck with the record. We're going to have another one of our pop records, another oldie, in fact, and after that, I'll give you the full details of the Doctor Who record and the number and all the details. So if you want to get a pencil and paper handy, I'll give you all those details after we've heard this record. Meantime, I'll say to you, Tom Baker, thanks very much. Not at all. Goodbye.